a government. You call that a government? Looks more like the invention of a deranged snotling. From Count Claude Villecroix of Paravon, a Bretonian ambassador to the court of the Emperor Karl Franz. Contrary to popular beliefs, the Empire is not a unified nation ruled by a powerful central government, but is in actuality a massive confederation of fiercely independent states and provinces whose inhabitants are tied together only by a common language, a shared faith in Sigma, and a mutual imperial culture. Nowadays, there are two types of states, the provinces and the city-state. Sigma was a wise and calculating leader, and he had the foresight to recognize that the empire was far too big to be ruled by a single man, and so he gave the title of counts to all the tribal leaders each responsible for managing his own territory, but subject to the Emperor in matters relating to its rulership. Their independence was supposed to counterbalance the power of the Emperor, should he prove too tyrannical as a leader, as well as to ensure mutual but non-violent competition amongst each of the Imperial Counts. When it became known that Sigma did not have an heir to inherit the imperial throne. The invention of the electoral system was successful in avoiding a civil war amongst the various counts. However, it complicated matters even further in creating and maintaining a successive ruler. Those ambitious elector counts that wished to become emperor have been known to give away privileges, titles, and power to any man that will cast his vote for him. The interests of each voters were such that they seldom rallied around a strong candidate, for they may find another of his rivals far more generous in their gifts, which has resulted in the weakening of the imperial system. Even when the imperial throne is transferred to his heir by majority vote, thanks to the previous emperor's influence, voters were quick to remind the newly elected emperor to renew the promises made by his predecessor. While the empire had a fair share of strong and highly competent emperors ruling the empire, Many times has the imperial throne been occupied by an uncaring lord who allows his subjects to steal and exploit the imperial system and her people, often going so far as to ignore the imperial edicts once placed by wise and caring rulers of ages past. However, the imperial system as a whole still continues to work for the Empire as was its purpose, allowing any wise and ambitious Emperor to take the throne and use its powers to better the people under their reign. And now, on to the Imperial Law. In theory, the Emperor is free to make whatever laws and regulations he or she wishes and have it apply to the whole of the Empire. The truth is more nuanced, for laws must pass the review of the Prime Estates, who report to the electors. One bad report is often all the excuse an elector needs to quietly not enforce the law or deny it altogether in times of a weak emperor. In such cases, the emperor, if he is determined to see the law obeyed, will exercise diplomatic and even public pressure on the recalcitrant elector to come to heel. Often this is enough to gain grudging acceptance. But if the elector is determined, 
an emperor may claim peremptory jurisdiction and have the case heard in his own courts. In rare cases, continued defiance by an elector may merit military action, as Karl Franz's ancestor Wilhelm threatened against Elector Gunwald of Avaland in the case of the Pudding Tax Revolt of 2433 IC. Imperial law concerns itself mostly with revenues, security from foreign and internal threats, the regulation of sorcery, and the rooting out of chaos cults. Many emperors have claimed jurisdiction over the succession to electoral thrones when the succession is in dispute, and even the right in extreme cases to depose electors, elevate new families to the electoral rank, and even give whole provinces to another elector, as was the case with Drakvald under Emperor Mundred. Though rooted in ancient law and the precedent set by Sigmar himself, no elector formally acknowledges this right and all resist it in any but the direst cases, lest a lasting precedent is set. Imperial courts exist in all the major cities of the Empire including the capitals of the Grand Provinces, with judges appointed by the Emperor through the office of the Imperial Authority over the case, leading to extended wrangling while the defendant or parties to a civil case swing in the wind. The Council of State Due to its size, the Imperial Government is considered far too large and complex for a single man or woman to function properly. It is common that each day the Emperor must devote attention to dozens of questions, from newly introduced tax policies, the final appeal of a prisoner convicted of treason, or even the official opening of a ceremonial fairground. To succeed in establishing a priority order in this complex system and ensure that only individuals whose cases are really crucial get an audience with the Emperor himself, successful Emperors have often surrounded themselves with advisers chosen from members amongst the most prominent noble families so that they may assist on legal financial, diplomatic, and military matters in the Emperor's stead. Over time, this gathering of councillors turned into a formal meeting, which officially became the Council of State. The current members of the State Council are Folkmar the Grim, the spiritual leader, Siegfried von Walfen, the Chancellor of the Reichland, Balthasar Geld, the Counselor of Matters Magical, Amadeus Menken, the Chamberlain of the Sea, Kurt Helborg, the Military Advisor to the Emperor, Lotte Horsfall, the Chancellor of the Imperial Treasury, Agatha von Bern, the Supreme Law Lord, and Arne Darmstadt, the Chamberlain of the Imperial House. Each member of the council controls a large bureaucracy that helps administer the affairs of the state. Such is the importance of their position within the government that the common people will probably never see these members in person, except maybe indirectly in official or ceremonial events. The Prime Estates the Prime Estates is an imperial organization that was created to help administrate the actions and well-being of the Emperor in person. At the end of the 11th century, when Boris the Incompetent tried to confer the title of Duke to his favorite racehorse, the electors unanimously decided that they had to administrate the Emperor's actions as to keep face with the Empire's people. So, 
they deputed one representative each to form a watchdog body that would take the name of Prime Estates. This institution is located within a beautiful building in the confines of the capital, ostensibly open to any person of recognized nobility, although the lackeys of the Emperor are carefully kept away. In fact, the Prime Estates has now become the Supreme Court. All Imperial Edicts are carefully examined in the interest of the state, with documented reports being immediately sent to the electors who would choose either to support or veto the Edict. This organization has the powerful ability to refuse any edict that does not suit them or the Empire's interests, allowing the Prime Estates to have near-complete control over what the Emperor is logically placed to decide. Each elector count has ensured an established representation in the capital, embassies directed by a loyal family member or close acquaintance. These ambassadors would discuss new imperial decree or legislation, as well as send these reports back to the electors that had elevated them to such a position. As they have the power to reject the decisions that do not suit them, it is important for the Emperor to obtain the approval of the Prime Estate if he hopes to accomplish anything. In theory, the Emperor also has a veto over the choice, but in practice, it would be very difficult for him to exercise it. Indeed, without a real majority support amongst the electors, the Emperor has no chance to assert his right of veto. The latest attempt to do so was Emperor Mateus II, who wished to institute the first ever democracy. But the threat of civil war by the other elector counts was so pressing that he was forced to give it up. The Provincial Government Since the time of Sigmar Heldenhammer, the lands of what is today the Empire was divided between many semi-autonomous states that are collectively referred to as the Great Provinces or Electoral Provinces, named because the Elector Counts who rule them traditionally have a say in the election of the next Emperor. The provinces are further divided into various counties, baronies, or leagues whose administrative governors are appointed by the Elector Count. These regional governors in turn appoint the governors of cities. This practice, however, is not universally prevalent. Some cities have been known to elect their own municipal council. Theoretically, the boundaries of the imperial provinces were based on the territories of the ancient barbarian tribes that Sigmar had united around him during his reign as the nation's first emperor. However, over the last several centuries, the dynastic quarrels and ruthless ambition between various lords and counts have altered the borders where new states have emerged while others have since disappeared from history. The patriotic citizenry that lives within these provinces are fiercely proud of their people's traditions and ancestry. In essence, the people of each provinces are in many ways a completely different people with many expressions or dialects varying from province to province. The people of the East and North are generally more hardy and warlike as they are regularly victims of invasions, while those in the West and South are perceived as more cosmopolitan and civilized or effeminate and proud, according to the view of the person to whom a person asks. The style of government also varies from province to province. Talabakland, for example, is firmly autocratic, 
while Solande had many democratic ideals and institutions during its existence. In the overall health of the nation, however, the political structure between various governments has very little influence on the lives of the citizens of the empire overall, for the rich are still wildly favoured over the poor who live in squalor. The lands of the great provinces are themselves a patchwork of smaller semi-autonomous states or holdings belonging to a certain religious cult or martial order, chartered towns and cities, and lands held by various noble families or even elector counts of other provinces. This patchwork is the result of a millennia of feudalism, inheritance, war and purchases. Each noble, from the smallest landholders to the greatest duke, is theoretically beholden to one above him, up to the elector counts, who would then answer only to the emperor himself. Thus, if the emperor has a problem with the Duke of Nibelwald, he has to make his complaints through the Elector of Avaland, who the Duke is a vassal towards. The City-States The City-State forms a privileged, semi-autonomous state that can assert its political, legal and military defense on a specific territory, the closed city wall and its immediate entour. The city is a concentration of economic, political, religious, academic and ideological power, thanks to its very diverse society and its semi-democratic ruling. Most cities form independent political entities within the greater imperial government. For the vast majority of the inhabitants of the empire, it is through the city that government is manifested in everyday life. This is where the taxes are collected, where the criminal courts are served, where a military service is completed, and where the goods are sold. The governmental structure varies from city to city. In some of them, the governor is sometimes appointed by the elector count as an autocratic authority whilst others consist of democratically elected individuals from several noble or mercantile families.